So, uh, yeah, I'm in 2 3. Let, let, this, I didn't get to this idea. Uh, in a way, I did. In a way, I didn't. Uh, this is kind of a famous limit. Um, the limit of sine x over x as x goes to zero. It's kind of a, a famous limit. And the truth is, we, we did do this problem a day or two ago. Uh, it showed up in, in section 2-2, two, two, and we did it numerically. I made a little chart, and uh, I plugged some numbers in, and uh, we, we, we found the answer. But you may not remember that, but we did. Uh, and and it, it was in your homework, I think, in 2-2. Two, two. But, but anyway, it's kind of a famous limit, and so it shows up here in 2-3 as its own little theorem. It's a special theorem. So, and so they say that the answer to this is 1. And so we, we put it in a, a blue box or a gray box in the book, and it's, it's a theorem. <laughs> and it's true, and we just kind of use it. We believe it and use it. Again, it was sort of proved analytically. I mean, no, 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 I'm sorry, numerically. We made a little chart. We plugged in some little 0.1s, 0.001s, and we discovered that this ratio goes to 1. That's what we discovered. Negative, negative 0.1, negative 0.001. I mean, you just plug it in numerically, and that's what we've decided. So that's cool. Um, you can't really do it analytically. So then, so then we, we, we just call this one. By the way, it, I want to say, you know, in words, here's what this says. Um, <clears throat> it says that the sine of x over x, as x gets really small, is, 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 is 1. Let me try to say that another way. When your angle is very small, uh, the sine of that angle over the angle is, practic is, is about the, the sine of an angle and the angle itself is practically the same thing. That's what that says. And when, when your numerator and denominator are practically the same thing, isn't that a, a one? When, the angle, when an angle is really, really small, the sine of the angle at o and the angle itself are practically the same thing. And so its ratio is one. I mean, I'm using words, I'm saying this different ways. I mean, it's just a theorem on the board, it's just math on the board, but I'm trying to say it a few different ways. Because I know up in some physics classes, and some higher physics classes, they'll, they'll use this idea. If they have the sine of x, they'll just replace it with an x. If they're working in an equation and they have the sine of x, they'll just replace it with an x. And we're saying that's okay for very small angles. For very small angles, the sine of x is x, and this ratio is 1. Or it's close enough. <clears throat> so that's that idea. Now what happens in our 2-3 homework is all of a sudden they give us this idea. <clears throat> the limit as x goes to 0 of the sine of 3x over uh, 4x. So they give us problems like this. So this shows up in 2.3, and, and let me try to help you with this idea. And they, what they want me to do is they want me to use this special theorem. And so, uh, you know, to me, this special theorem only kind of works when, well, first of all, when the angle's going to zero, and then also that angle has to match that denominator. Uh, so that angle x has to match that denominator x. Now, it doesn't really look like I have that quite here. I have a three x which is an angle inside that sine function. Uh, but I wish, so I kind of wish the denominator was a three X. I think, you know, if the, if the angle matches the denominator and it's headed towards zero, which it is, then I can grab it and call it a one, according to this theorem. The limit as the X goes to zero, I can grab it and call it a one, but I need, I need this to match. Uh, so, you know, you can do, this is one, I mean, you, 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 when you do math, sometimes you do this algebraic manipulation. You just make things do what you want, but you do it legally. I mean, I want to make that denominator a three. I want to make that denominator a three X. I tell you what, I'm going to think of it like this for a second. I'm going to go like this. I'm going to think of it as, I'm going to kind of pull the four away. I'm going to think of it as a one fourth and just leave an X there. I mean, that is the same thing. Do you agree? When you multiply fractions, you, I can put the four back. I'm sort of pulling the four away for a minute, and then I want to make it a three. I want to make it a three x. Not a three, but a three x. So I think I'll just 
How do you? I think I'll multiply by three. But that's, and I can do that if I multiply the numerator by three. Like that, I mean, that's legal algebra. I'm multiplying by a three over three. So I can force a three down there if I force a three up here. Now I'm doing the limit as x goes to zero, and I can grab that, and according to what I'm saying, I'm saying that fits the theorem. And, and doing the limit as x goes to zero, this matches this, the quantity is going to zero, the x is going to zero, this quantity is going to zero. I can grab that and call it a one. One times three-fourths is three-fourths, and that's my answer. And I'm using the theorem. Manipulating what was given to me. What was given to me didn't quite fit the theorem. I did a little algebraic manipulation to fit the theorem, and then it's easy, I think. You use the fact that that's a one. You know, students like to see shortcuts and see patterns, so I just explained this to you very well. Some students like to just say, well, you know, if that's a three and that's a four, then ain't that just the answer? Students talk like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, you're, you're on to something there, uh, but, you know, we're all about understanding and understanding and doing, you know, we're not about, oh, I see threes, I see fours, uh, I get credit uh, for writing a three fours, I, I don't know, uh, I think we're all about the proper understanding of things. Um, <laughs> Uh, by the way, <clears throat> uh, the book doesn't exactly say this, but this also works upside down. Uh, because this ratio is approaching 1 as x goes to 0, it works upside down, too. So if you ever see this, um, I mean, it's, it works. It's, it's also a 1. Uh, the ratio is approaching 1. Uh, whether it's right side up or upside down, it works. <clears throat> um, They've got another one here, uh, 1 minus cos x over x. The, the, here's another special theorem. The limit of 1 minus cos x over x as x goes to 0. I mean, you can try it and see what you get. Remember, step one of doing a limit is plug it in and see what you get. Uh, what do you get if you plug in your 0? Well, yeah, not exactly. You get that cosine of 0 which is a one. One minus one is zero over zero. So you get this zero over zero. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. I don't really want to use the word undefined when I'm doing a limit. I just, let's see, what was the word here? Yeah, the word was indeterminate actually. Close enough really in a way. But the point is, you ain't got an answer. Uh, and what you need is a little further investigation uh, again, I'm sorry, I'm not really trying to do this. This is kind of a special one that I'm not sure I know how to do. I would probably, I would do it numerically. I would plug in a lot of little numbers and see what happens. They say that the answer is zero, and they put it in a box, and they call it a special theorem, another special theorem. So there's another one for you. <clears throat> the truth is I'm a more of a fan of this one. This one, I'm more of a On my desk, if you were betting, what would you bet on? The first one, right. If you were betting or gambling or whatever, yeah. I mean, I'm just more of a fan of this one. But it's another theorem. Here's another one, uh, another special limit. This one's kind of interesting. This is almost uh, the limit as x goes to zero. Um, <clears throat> I don't even know. One plus x to the one over x. One plus x to the one over x. This is a very special, uh, <clears throat> little theorem. Uh, they say the answer is E. This, and it's almost like you could say this is the definition of what E is. You know, you've seen E in college algebra or pre-calculus. It's just a number. It's 2.718, blah, 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 blah. It's a number. Is it? I might have read this wrong. Um, no, this is as x goes to zero, but I think I know what you mean. Um, I could, there's an alternative version. I could do a little 
I could do some change in here. I could switch this to infinity, and I, you're right. I could, I could, I could change this up and make it be. So there is a similar limit as x. There's a similar, different limit as x goes to infinity that results in e. Yeah, similar and different. Um, so this is the way this one's presented to me in, in section two three. You know, this would be sort of fun to do. I mean, let's just let me just try something. If if x does go to zero, uh, let's let's try it numerically a second. Let's try a. Can I just try a 0.01? Let me try a 0.01. If I plug in a 0.01, would I get 1.01 raised to the one over 0.01? You agree? I'm just trying to plug in a 0.01. Uh, by the way, 1 over 1 one hundred is actually 100, so this is 1.01 raised to the hundredth, actually, is what this turns into. And what is that? I bet it's 2.7, so I don't know, maybe it's 2.6. 2 point, tell me what. 0.48. 0 0.48, blah, 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 okay. Remember, E is, is 2.71828, I think it's 1828, but that's not a pattern, then it diverts, there's no pattern there, but it looks like there is for a second. Um, anyway, what did I do? I plugged in a .01, it looks like, I believe this thing on. <laughs> I could plug in a .001, it would be even closer. I could plug in a .00001, it would be even closer. I can check it from the other side. Check a negative 0.001. It should, same thing, should happen. I think. <clears throat> um, so, cool. So, if I'm looking at the homework, there is a little batch of these trig problems, okay, that might use these theorems. Those theorems are, and I don't know, if they might use this one. I haven't seen, used this one too much. I thought it was interesting, but uh, I haven't used it too much. Um, I assigned some problems here. Let me see. I don't want to do your homework for you. Let me try, let me try this one. What's this one? The limit of tangent squared x over x as x goes to zero. Um, this happens to be number 72 in 2.3. Uh, well, anyway, I'm in 2.3. I'm trying to do limits. Step one of doing a limit, plug it in. See what you get. I mean, maybe you get zero. Maybe you get 12. Maybe, you know, you might get an answer. What usually happens, though, is you get this, right, which is not an answer, and, and you got to do some, some figuring, some work uh, of some sort. Uh, but let's see what happens. If you plug in a zero, anybody know the tangent is zero? <clears throat> you could use your calculator, maybe. It's, uh, but it's zero radians is what it is. The tangent is zero. Turns out to be zero <laughs> over zero. So, again, we are in this situation. I, could have predicted that. So it's zero over zero. I need to do something. Uh, by the way, here's another thought. I'm sorry. Here's a, here's another. This is just a, this is an old review thought. Okay. I mean, I should have, this should have come up in our review. I don't know if I, if it did. When when we see tangent squared x, you guys should know that's how it's written. And you know what it means? It means it's the tangent of the tangent function squared is what it means. Mm -hmm. We don't write it like that though. When it's when a, when a trig function is squared, we 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 put the exponent there. So the whole trig function is squared. Uh, we, should, we should know that. Uh, <clears throat> sometimes students, I see students don't realize that. Uh, well, I think I'm going to change, you know, if I got these theorems at my disposal here to try to use, then I think I'm going to change tangent to, to sine over cosine. So I'm going to use some trig identities. It's good to know some basic trig identities. That's a very basic one. Tangent of x is sine x over cosine x. 
So I'm gonna use that one. I'm gonna substitute, let me see what happens. So now I've got the sine of x squared over the cosine of x squared, or the cosine squared of x. Now I just replaced tangent squared with sine squared over cosine squared. And then that's all over an x. Hmm. Now I've got fractions over fractions. I hate that. <clears throat> you know what I'd like to do? Flip and multiply. Flip him up and multiply by 1 over x, which puts him in this denominator. Are you okay with that? I'm doing math. I'm doing math. Uh, basically, it's algebra. A lot of algebra. So I manipulated this a little bit. I'm not, I'm not sure if I've made progress at all, but I, I turned it into sine over cosine, sine squared over cosine squared. It's all over this x, so I flipped the x up. So now it looks like this. Uh, if I try plugging in the zero right now, let's see what happens. If I plug the zero in right now, that's the sine of zero, which is zero. Over, if I plug in a zero there, uh, well, that's a one. The cosine of zero is one. But but if I plug in a zero there, then my denominator is a zero. So it's still zero over zero at the moment, which sucks. Uh, right, needs fixing. Uh, do you see this theorem anywhere? Do you see this? I do. I see that. Do y'all see that? Yes. It's in there, kind of. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm going to back up over here. What I see is I'm going to just separate that numerator, not separate, but that sine squared, I'm going to think of it as a sine x times a sine x. That's what it is, of course. And then it's over this x times this cosine squared x. But now, and as x goes to zero, I'm going to sort of grab that and say, hey, that's the theorem. I mean, that piece of it is the theorem. And so as x goes to zero, what can I grab that and I can call that one? I can grab that and call that a one. Let's, let's plug in zero into the rest of it. I get the sine of zero there. That's a zero. zero. And I get the cosine of zero there, which is a one. a one. So now I have zero over one times one. Guess what that is? Zero. It's zero over one. Anyway, it's zero over one, which I guess I could call zero, <laughs> oh, times this one. And zero times one is zero. zero. I mean, it's kind of weird. All of a sudden, I mean, there is no zero over zero anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, by using the theorem, I could grab that and call that one. I got, I manipulated it a little bit to where I got into a, I used the theorem and I got out of my zero over zero situation. That's, I mean, that zero over zero situation is just, it's just, you don't know, it's indeterminate. You might be tempted to call it zero. And in this case, if you would have called it zero, you would have been right. Uh, maybe you're tempted to call it one. And in certain cases, you're right. Uh, but the thing is, you don't know. It's zero over zeros, indeterminate. You gotta manipulate and play until you can determine what's going on. And I got myself into a situation where I think I had, that's a zero. A zero times one is zero, and I'm done. Manipulating and playing and, and using this when you can, uh, when you can, when you can. <clears throat> um, all right. Uh, all right. So you can try some more of this homework now. Now that you know this, uh, you can try some of that trig homework that's up in the '60s or '70s there, like I found. Um, <clears throat> And ask me some questions. Um, <clears throat> I'm gonna I want to say this. Uh, a slope. <clears throat> you know, a slope is a is a change in y over a change in x, right, you guys? And it's 
you know, this is back to algebra a second. It's, you know, a y2 minus a y1 over an x2 minus an x1. Um, if I had word problem, if I was in a word problem, then my, I, I tend to use the word rate. My slope is more of like a rate or a rate of change. I mean, maybe, maybe my y values are a population of people and the population is growing over, and maybe x is time in years. And so I have certain number of people per year. You follow me? Certain number of people per year. I mean, you hear that word per year. I mean, it's a rate. It's, it's some kind of a rate of people per year. Maybe I've got money uh, and my money is, I'm losing money every month or something. So I've got dollars per month, right? Some kind of a rate. It's a rate. It's a ratio. It's a slope. It's a, it, it's a rate. The most popular one is maybe that's uh, maybe that's distance and it's miles, and then this is time, like hours, and then you got miles per hour. You got some kind of average uh, speed or velocity or speed. You hear me? That's what a slope is. I mean, it, it, sometimes we just think of a slope of a line, but in a, in a real problem, it's it's some kind of a rate, rate <laughs> of change between two variables. So. You know, on your uh, on your little review sheet that you did, you did there was one of these distance equals rate times distance equals rate times time. And if you did solve for the rate, the rate is you didn't have to do this, I don't think, on your pro on your problem. But if you solve for the rate, the rate is distance over time. You guys with me? And that's just kind of classic, basic algebraic ideas. Uh, and I just sort of got done saying that. If, 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 if I have a distance over a time, then that's a rate. Uh, and, and, and the rate is the speed, or maybe you say velocity. It's a little difference in those words. <clears throat> velocity can have a sign on it like positive or negative. If, if I throw a ball up, it's got a positive velocity. Of course, gravity is going to slow it down. It's going to reach its peak and then it's going to start falling down. And when it's falling down, it's going to have a negative velocity. So it has a positive velocity and then it has a negative velocity. Velocity has a sign on it, positive or negative, depending on which way it's going. That, that's an important part of velocity. Speed is really just the number. Speed is, in other words, speed is the absolute value of velocity. You following me? I mean, it's just, I don't care whether it's going up or down. I just want to know how fast it's going. That's speed, I guess. So, so I was loosely using those words. Maybe now I'm specifically using those words, perhaps. Uh, <laughs> um, <clears throat> So, one of the popular word problems we do is we do that. We, 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 I'm going to do this. I'm a, uh, I climb up to the top of the building seven up here. I'm uh, 35 feet above the ground and I, sorry about that. <clears throat> Let's see, I'm, 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 I'm 30 feet above the ground and I throw uh, a ball up. And the ball goes up and it comes down and hits one of my students walking on the sidewalk. Don't worry, it's just a tennis ball. It shouldn't hurt you too much. Uh, you guys with me? Uh, this is time and it's probably in seconds. And I can use T instead of X, I guess. And this is distance or height. And, and you know, it'd be nice to use H for height, but we tend to use S. S is, is this distance, or in this case, it's, it is height. So instead of Y and X, I'm using S and T. And uh, I can write a, an equation for this. Oh, I do have to say, to make the equation, I do have to tell you, um, <clears throat> oh, by the way, this distance is in feet. We'll do this in feet. And so I do have to tell you how fast I threw it. Let's say I, I threw it with an initial velocity, that's called an initial velocity of, uh, I'm just making this up. Um, <clears throat> I throw it pretty hard, but it is just a 10. 
kind of small. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, I don't know. 48 feet per second. Hey, that is positive, which means I threw it up. I threw it up. It goes up. It comes down. Right? It started at 30. It had a positive velocity. Initially, it had a positive velocity. It will go up here and reach a, a peak. You know, when it reaches its peak, technically, it stops. It stops. And its velocity is zero. And then after that, it starts falling down and it has a negative velocity. You can't see it stop, right? Unless you had a really cool camera. <clears throat> What stops? Like, the ball stops. The ball goes up. It has this. It has this initial velocity, but right out, right as soon as you throw it, gravity starts slowing it down. Right? Gravity slows it down, and so this number starts getting slower. Every, I mean, this it starts going slower, and then at some point, it technically hits zero. Its velocity is zero, but it's only for a second. Not even a second. A split second. A microsecond. And then it starts falling down, and then it starts, gravity speeds it up. Gravity accelerates it and pulls it down faster and faster and faster. You know what? It left this level here at 48 feet per second. You know when it gets back, back to this level, you know what its speed's going to be? 48 or negative 48 feet per second. Right. By the time it hits the ground, it'll be going faster than that, I guess. Gravity's going to make it go faster. And it hits the ground with a certain speed. <clears throat> but to calculate that velocity or that speed, I guess I need sort of this distance over time. And usually what we're doing is we've got two distances. <clears throat> S of S of S of T2 minus S of T1 over a T2 minus a T1. I mean it's a it's a change in distance over a change in time. I'm using S for my distance. I'm using T for my time. It's just it's this formula uh, put into some words, put into some just slope actually, and that would be the average velocity. Um, here, let me tell you the equation for this. I told you some details. The actual equation for the height of this ball is negative 16 t squared plus 48 t plus 30. <clears throat> We'll work with this all semester, so we'll get back to this, and I can share some of the details, but maybe you see some of the details already. Uh, turns out that number is uh, the initial velocity. That's the word there, initial velocity. It's a V with a little subscript zero. Anytime you see a subscript zero, it's probably the initial or starting amount. So it's the initial velocity. Uh, I could call this 30 uh, the initial height. Is that okay with you? The initial height. Um, all right, let's get to work on this. I'm making up this problem. I got some stuff to say. It takes me a while. Uh, <clears throat> um, what do I want to say? <laughs> uh, uh, here's what I want to say. What's the height after uh, three seconds? What's the height after three seconds? Which I think would be this, right? Plug in a three and tell me the height. All right, so I need some help. I need some calculator help. I'm plugging in a three. Uh, three squared, uh, three. What's the height of three seconds? By the way, you guys know about parabolas. This is a parabola, right? It's an upside down parabola. It has a vertex. We could talk about when does it reach its maximum height. I mean, this is not really calculus. I could talk about the vertex of a parabola. That's algebra. Uh, and I, I don't know if I, uh, anyway, I want to know this. What's the height after three seconds? 30 feet. What is it? 30. 30? 30. 30? Yeah. Well, that's a miracle. I got lucky there. Uh, guess what I just found? Uh, I found this place, I think, didn't I? Is that what I just did? Yeah. Yeah. At three seconds, that's its height. That's... I didn't really mean to do that. I was just picking a random 
time, and I thought I'd get a random height, but it, and I did, but it's not that random. It's kind of a special height. It's, uh, yeah, it took three seconds to go up and come back down to this level. Yeah, it's going to keep falling. Okay, it's going to fall down to the ground. <clears throat> I'll be darned. By the way, that makes me, you know what? If it took three seconds to get up and back down, these parabolas are symmetric. How long did it take to get to the peak then? 1.5 seconds, it's at, it's at the peak, yeah. yeah, it sure is. I wasn't really gonna try to do that, but I stumbled onto it, yeah. Let's do this, what's S of one, S of one? In other words, what's the height after one second, please? Uh, and you plug in a one, you do the math, you get the height. Okay, maybe he's right. I, was, I wasn't doing it. I was daydreaming for a second. Uh, you plugged in a one. You plugged in a one. That's a negative 16, right, you guys? Yeah. And and uh, that's 48. 62. I think he's right. 62 feet. That's uh, where is that? That's over here. Uh, at one second, it's on its way up. It hit. A, it hit a height of 62 feet, apparently. Okay. Well, anyway. One thing I could ask you for then is the, the rate, the speed, or the velocity <clears throat> between these two times that I just discussed. Now, but between two times, then, then, the, then, then what I'm asking for is called, I mean, it's a slope, uh, but, but it would be called an average slope. It's an average velocity. And so I would like to know the average velocity, and I'm using that word, it's important, I think. I want to know the average velocity during this, these two times. <clears throat> so in other words, from here, not the whole trip, but from here to here, what was its average velocity? And we can calculate that. That, that's what this is, and I, maybe I should have put that. That's what this slope is. It's an average velocity. Uh, so what do I need? I need, I need to, look, it's a slope. I need to subtract my y values and subtract my x values, you guys. Uh, I, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> these are my y values. <clears throat> I mean, this is a y value minus this y value over, what are my x values? One, and thank you. Uh, over three minus one. Right, that's it. I mean, that, that, so my times, it's my distance over my time. It's my change in distance over my change in time. It's just like my change in y over my change in x. Yeah, so what is this? That's the 62 minus the 30. Oh, no, wait. I screwed that up. Hold on. I got that backwards, right? S of 3 was the 30. The 30 minus the 62 over the 3 minus 1. Okay. Uh, uh, Come over here. Negative 32, is that what that is? Negative 32 over 2. Negative 16 feet per second, I guess. Hey, I'm sorry, but that's a total coincidence that it's 16. Uh, <clears throat> this is a 16 here, uh, which is a rather famous number. Um, Coincidences going on. <clears throat> students, I get worried about coincidences because students latch on to coincidences and think, oh, the answer is always negative 16 or something. I don't know. <laughs> students, students do funny things sometimes. So I feel like I got to explain things, uh, which I do because I'm a teacher. Um, <laughs> you know, I sort of, I showed you what these numbers were. You know, that's the initial height. This formula, it, it came out of the, my head. But it's true, an accurate formula. That's the initial height. That's the initial velocity. I didn't explain that number, and I guess I will right now. That 16 turns out to be gravity, but it ain't gravity. It's half of gravity is actually what it is. It's gravity over 2. Now, hang on a second. When you think of gravity, does a number pop in your head? I mean, do you know anything about gravity? Do you know about gravity? You, it's an acceleration. It's called an acceleration toward Earth, and there's a number associated with gravity. There's a few numbers associated. What, does a number pop in your head? What is it? I was hoping you say 9.8. Does 9.8 jump in your head? That's gravity. 
Listen, that's gravity, that's meters per second squared. Okay, so when we're not in meters, when we're in feet, gravity is different. Gravity is 32. You hear me? It's 32 feet per second squared. It's a different, maybe that number doesn't pop in your head, but it's accurate. In feet per second squared, gravity is 32, and it turns out that that number is half of gravity. <clears throat> anyway, we just happened to get this number. <laughs> this is, I mean, we could have we got 22 or 27, or we could have got anything here, okay? Uh, we, we just just stumbled onto this number. Okay. <laughs> so, um, Hey, you know what? I was going to predict that that answer was negative. You know, I was doing the average velocity between these two numbers. Look at this. It's the average velocity. I mean, again, like I said, when it left my hand, it was going 48 feet per second. But as soon as it leaves my hand, gravity changes it. Gravity starts slowing it down. And then, you know, it's going 47, 46, 45, 44, mm. I mean, it's 32. It's going these different speeds at these different times. It reaches up here and it goes zero for just a split second. And then it starts going negative one, negative two, negative three feet per second. You follow me? I mean, it just, it's always changing. It's a constantly changing velocity. It's speeding up and slowing down. I'm sorry. It's slowing down is what it's doing. It's slowing down the whole time. It's slowing down and then speeding up toward Earth. Right, right. That's what it's doing. And, and these velocities are positive up until that point, and these velocities are negative up until that point. And I looked at this picture and I thought, you know what? I bet the average velocity is going to be negative because it looks like it's spending more time on its way down than it did on its way up. Yeah. You see, just my picture. I just thought, yeah, look, it looks like it's spending more time on the way down than it is. It's, it's probably got a negative answer, which it did. So if it's spending more time going up, is it a positive velocity? It probably the average, right. But average is kind of weird. I mean, during this time, I mean, really what I'd like is the instantaneous velocity. I'd like the velocity at one particular instant. Well, that's calculus. Well, it means, hang on. It means instead of doing a slope between two points, maybe I should be doing a slope at one point, which is kind of like our tangent line that we did. Remember that? That's the slope at one point. Well, so the velocity, the instantaneous velocity, would be the velocity at just one point. And we did sort of, I haven't really, I mean, I've previewed the thought, but in order to do that, I think I might need a limit. What if I was trying to do, I want, what if I want to know the velocity at this moment? By the way, I already know the velocity at this moment. I, remember? What is the velocity at this moment? Yeah, it's negative 48. How did I know that? Just because I got lucky, right? Wait a minute. Sorry. Let's say I want the velocity at that moment. Because I'm freaking you guys out. I don't know the velocity at that moment. What is that? One second later? One second after I threw it, yeah, you know what? I do know the velocity at that moment. <clears throat> what did I say gravity does? What is gravity? Negative 32 feet per second per second. It's called an acceleration is what it is. And what, it, what an acceleration does is an acceleration changes velocities. An acceleration, you know how, you know. If you're cruising down the road at 30 miles an hour, nice, got it on cruise control, you're going 30 miles an hour, what's your acceleration? Zero, thank you, you're not accelerating, you're cruising at a constant velocity. You have zero acceleration. But you can speed up and you have an acceleration that's positive. You can hit the brakes and slow down, you'll have an acceleration that's negative. Acceleration changes velocity is what it does. And it, look how it changes it. You ready? It changes it at negative 32 feet per second every second. You hear me? Negative 32 feet per second every second. That's how it works. So damn, I got this all figured out. Uh, <clears throat> What am I saying? What am I saying? I'm saying, uh, 
What did I start off with? My velocity was 48 feet per second. Well, what happens after one second? After one second, what's my velocity? I think it changed after one second. I think it changed by negative 32 feet per second. After one, every second, it changes negative 32 feet per second. So what is it after one second? 16, that's my, that is my instantaneous velocity at one second is what that is. What happens after another second? It's negative 16? Yeah, that's another second. That's basically, that's two seconds from when I threw it. That, that's what happens. Every second, it lose, gravity is, is slowing me down. Um, you know what happened between 16 and negative 16? You hit the peak and started back down. I guess. What about one more second later? By the way, that's three seconds, right? One more second later, what is it? Negative 48 feet per second. Yeah. Cool. That's how gravity works. One more second. What's one more second? Negative 64? No, wait. Sorry. Negative 80? Yeah, sorry. Negative 80 feet per second. Wow. Yeah, you know what? These are instantaneous velocities. These are instantaneous, instantaneous velocities. Uh, by the way, that word starts with the letter I, instantaneous. It's the velocity at these particular instances. Uh, I also used another word that started with an I. What did I use over here? Initial. Initial. Don't get those confused. I think students do get those confused. This is the initial velocity. This is just what it was when it left my hand, right? That's a totally different thing. Well, it's the instantaneous velocity initially. <laughs> Only initially, right? <clears throat> wow, that's pretty interesting. Um, you know, maybe I could have called this uh, the velocity. I could have the velocity at zero seconds. That's what that was. This is the velocity at one second. This is the velocity at two seconds. This is the velocity at three seconds. And so on. Could have notated it like that. <clears throat> they are instant. They're not average velocities. They're instantaneous velocities at those moments. Mm -hmm. At those moments. <clears throat> I was thinking that if I wanted this instantaneous velocity, instantaneous velocity, this is what your book says. If I want the instantaneous velocity at t equals just a generic a seconds, then here's what I do. Uh, actually, what I do is I find the average velocity from s of t to s of a, hang on just a second, your book actually swaps those. You know, you can subtract these, you can subtract this stuff in any order, as long as you're consistent. I'm just gonna do what the book did though. They, I'm gonna do s of a minus s of t. What is this? This is a specific time, and this is just some roaming time, some generic time. And I wanna find the, the, the average velocity between these two times, Wait a minute, no I don't, I don't want an average velocity. I want the instantaneous velocity. So I want, what I want is I want to do this when I take the limit and T approaches A. I don't know if I explained that too well. <clears throat> I explained all that really well. <clears throat> I'm trying to say that an instantaneous velocity is this velocity at one moment and we use a limit, we can use a limit to get this. Although I've just avoided limits over there. Uh, I can use a limit to find the velocity at one moment. T at, at t equals a. Yeah, 
this is sort of anticlimactic. <clears throat> Using a limit to do it after what I just did. You know what I just did? I just used logic, actually. Beautiful logic, actually, <clears throat> to do it. I said every second my gravity is going to change my velocity. That was very nice. Uh, and it started here. Every second it changes velocity. I mean, can, So could you find could you find the velocity at uh, at 2.3 seconds based on my little chart that I was doing? What was I doing? Every second I was subtracting 32. Is that what I was doing? Every second I was subtracting 32 from this. Can you do that with a 2.3 seconds? I guess you can. How would you do it? I mean, every set, I'm subtracting. I'm starting with this 48. And what am I doing? I'm subtracting 32, which is my gravity, times how long I've been in the air. Right. That's what I've been doing. That's what I was doing. And I was doing it for nice even numbers and it all made sense now, but to do it for a 2.3, I'll be darned, you could do this. This would work. Damn, I just taught you calculus. I mean, I just, I mean, without knowing it, we just jumped all the way up to chapter three. We're supposed to build our way to chapter three using limits. We're supposed to build our way up there using limits. Uh, so we're supposed to do this. <clears throat> At least we're ahead. <laughs> well, I, it, it, can I even do this? I'm, so I'm going to try this. I'm going to try this at 2.3. You ready? I'm going to try this. I'm kind of scared though. Um, where is 2.3 by the way? Probably right about here. I want to find that velocity, that instantaneous velocity. By the way, here's the answer. Somebody, go ahead and tell me the answer. Uh, negative 25.6 feet per second. This is the instantaneous velocity at that moment. It's right there. <clears throat> it, that's my speed. It's just a little bit after I reach my peak. It's a negative velocity. Makes sense. I'm going to try to do it like this. Uh, this might be horrific. You ready? It might be horrific. <clears throat> There's my formula. <clears throat> I mean, that's my S. That's my formula for this. And I want to do this. I want to do. I want to do this when a is 2.3 seconds. So I want to do the limit as t approaches 2.3 seconds. If this gets horrific, I might just quit. <laughs> I mean, my resignation letter is all ready. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't mean that kind of quick. <laughs> uh, I'm, I want to do this at 2.3. I want to plug 2.3 into the function. That's what that says. Here, I'll write that down. I want to plug 2.3 into the function, get that height. This is funny. This is just the function without really anything. Well, it's the function with a T plugged in. It's not a, yeah, just a variable T. See, we got a variable T, and we're letting that variable T get closer and closer to 2.3 seconds. That's what we're doing to try to get the instantaneous velocity. Uh, down here, I need 2.3 minus t. All right, I don't know how this is gonna work. Watch what happens, watch what happens. Uh, plug 2.3 in there for me, please help me. 2.3 squared times this, da 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 It's a number, it's a number. Fifty-five. Fifty-five point seven six. 55.76, did you round that a little bit? Nope. No. Okay, good, thank you very much. 55.76, that's what happens, that's the height when you plug in 2.3 seconds apparently. Uh, minus S of T, now that's funny, that's just S of T, that's the whole function. That is the function. Okay, all right, all right, all right, all right. Uh, all over 2.3 minus T. Let me clean this up. 
I'm going to distribute the negative sign. I'm going to gather like terms, and this is going to look a little different. You ready? As t goes to 2.3, uh, the denominator is 2.3 minus t. Uh, the numerator is going to be, watch this, a positive 16t squared. Do you agree with that? Yeah. A negative 48t. Yeah. And if I distribute this negative over here, negative 30, and add it to the 55.76, that would be... 25.76. Damn, now what? How do I do this limit? How do I do this limit? If I plug it in right now, you know, step one of doing a limit is plug it in, see what you get. You know what I think you get? What do you get? Well, what do you get in the denominator? Zero. Thank you. You get a zero in your denominator. I'm not even going to bother. I bet you the numerator is a zero. I think I get zero over zero, which means I'm sort of stuck. <clears throat> I don't know if you tried any of the earlier homework in 2.3. or I did a couple examples. When, when you see a limit like this, and this one looks nasty though, man, but how would you usually fix something like this with a zero over zero, but, 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 but with this kind of a look, what would you more normally... You could factor it. Yeah, we were factoring these things. <laughs> but nobody's probably factored 16t squared minus 48t plus 25.7. I mean, you probably never factored something like that. But usually, you know, it would factor, and then the factor would cancel in the denominator, right? I mean, so guess what? I kind of got a hint of what the... I'm going to... Boy, oh boy, this is pretty cool. Wow. Um, <clears throat> I am going to factor that numerator. I hope I can get lucky, boy. I don't know. This is all on video, too. Uh, anyway, uh, I think I can factor into a 16t and a t. And uh, I, I swear to God, I'm going to put a negative 2.3 right here. Because my goal is to make it cancel with this 2.3 minus t. You hear me? I mean, I'm using some previous knowledge. To, uh, to think I know how to factor this. Now, now wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, if that's 2.3, what is this? I mean, uh, what is this? Don't, don't, don't these two numbers have to multiply to be 25.76? Okay, uh, I guess he would be a negative. Help me out. What is it? 11.2. 11.2, exactly. Okay, 11.2, dude. This is awesome. I swear, I think that's factored. Somebody should double check me. What if you multiply your, if you foiled it out, would you get 16t squared? Yeah. Uh, if you multiplied the outers and the inners, would you get 48t? Would you? Help me out. If you multiplied the outers and the inners, would you get? Really? And if you multiply the lasts, do you get 25.76? Oh my God. So we got it factored. All right, so I can cancel this bad factor. I can cancel this bad factor. Now wait a minute. Wait just a minute. Good. They're not really the same factor, right? One of them is T minus 2.3. The other one is 2.3 minus T. They're not quite the same. <clears throat> But they're off by a negative sign. I mean, did you know that? You know that? I mean, if you have an A minus B and a B minus A, hang on. If you have an A minus B over an A minus B, what do you call that? One, because it's the same thing over itself. When, when one of those is reversed, though, he's the negative of himself. So now that's a, that's a negative one. You can factor out a negative sign and prove it to yourself, but that's a negative one. So I'm usually sometimes, you, when you cancel things, you call that a one. When you cancel things like this, you call the answer negative one. So I'm canceling this, I'm canceling this, I'm calling it a negative one out here, or I'm calling that a negative one, I'm putting it out here, and now I think I'm ready to do this limit. And how do you do a limit? I can see I canceled my denominator. I canceled my zero over zero. That, so now I plug it in and get it. I see what I get. Uh, I'm going to get negative 1 times 16 times t, 2.3, minus the 11.2.
I guess you should work on that and then negate it. And what's the answer? Are you kidding me? Wow. Life is beautiful. <clears throat> that was awesome. <clears throat> We did it instantaneously. We found the velocity in one particular moment, dude. That's pretty crazy. <laughs> this thing's moving. This thing's moving. It's kind of, I mean, you know what? We did this at 2.3 seconds. Guess what? At 2.31 seconds, it's a little different. At 2.32 seconds, it's a little bit. I mean, it, right? Every split second, it's changing. And we found the velocity at this particular moment. There's two problems in the book like this. They're a little easier than the one I just made up. I didn't, I was worried this one might not go anywhere. Uh, the ones in the book are a little nicer than this one. They factor nicer. They, you don't have this middle term. They got a nicer problem without the middle term here. How do you have no middle term here? You have no initial velocity. How do you have no initial velocity? You just drop it, right? You're not, I, I threw this up, or you could throw it down. But if you just drop it, it has zero initial velocity. And that would be a zero, and that makes life a little easier. You ought to try these problems. They're in 2.3, and it's 107 through 110. I assigned them. They're in my homework. And, but now I've just sort of lectured on it uh, and tried to explain it. Maybe you got lost in there. Uh, but, but these are good problems. Um, <clears throat> And that's kind of where 2.3 kind of ends with these velocity problems like this. Uh, I think I'm going to quit today. And uh, maybe Friday we'll get into a little 2.4. We'll move on ahead a little bit. Keep working. I'm trying to catch up to me. Oh, wait, wait, wait. I got one announcement. <clears throat> um, oh, and I think I want to take roll too here. Hang on just a second.